Hello, uh, this is Hank242. Um, uh, today I will talk about finding that scope. Um, Julie has started the class, but I'm going to go over the slides and just to remind you. Uh, so, so far we have expressions, comments, and now uh, we are starting with declarations. Declarations are the essential part of the uh, programming language, higher level programming languages, because users use names to entities in the programming environment, variables, function, constants, uh, data types, and modules, etc. And uh, all these user defined uh, names are called identifiers. Uh, identifiers make uh, our life easier because. Uh, we don't have to uh, specify the actual uh, content of the programming language entity, like a variable, actually an address in the uh, computer's memory or a data type is completely abstracting and it can be too large to repeat again and again. Uh, and we have one basic principle uh, declare once, use as many times, we are going to call this abstraction in the following chapters, can be defined by, uh, you know, can be realized by uh, what we call identifiers. User is given an opportunity to name the things within the programming language. Uh, so what programmer does is actually define the identifier somewhere and then use it many times. So we will have a declaration position. We are going to uh, call that the binding occurrence. And we will have uh, the users of that declaration, which we are going to call them uh, applied occurrence. And this has to be handled by the programming language itself. So uh, in order to have this declare once used many times, programming language has to find the applied occurrences and uh, for all of the occurrences find the corresponding uh, binding occurrence. So we have such a mapping problem and that mapping problem is called binding. Uh, for all applied occurrences of an identifier, find the binding occurrence. Uh, so in order to define this binding, in order to solve this binding problem, we have to determine one important thing, the scope of the identifier. So we have the declaration at some point, and how long it is going to be active, that declaration will be active. So that when we use it, it is going to, it's going to be uh, available or not. And next question is, if there are uh, multiple occurrences of the same name, which of the binding occurrences it is going to refer to. So, uh, second question is that one actually. What will happen if we use the same name in two different places? A declare, a declaration uh, of the same name at two different places. And it, they don't have to be same type. For example, one declaration can be a data type, the other one can be a function, and the other one can vary. Uh, for example, your programming language has to put those rules, like overwrite, hide, or doesn't allow at all. Uh, see, it doesn't allow use of same identifier in the same scope, so it will give you a compilation error. Uh, and this is what, and for different scopes, the inner one, hide the other, it is called hiding. Uh, so in this example, here you see uh, the F and Y are both in the global scope. All functions are in global scope in C. Y is a global variable as well, and this is not a lot because we are using uh, same name, F, F in the global scope, Y twice in the global scope, not a lot. But on the, on the other hand, 
this one is uh, legal because you basically define f and y are as local variables, whereas this y and this f are global variables. Uh, the scope of the variables comes with another definition, which is uh, the environment. Environment is set of bindings at any instance of your program. That means you can have many statements in your code, many lines of code, uh, and at any point of time, you can determine the number of identifiers and their binding occurrences as a set, and that set is called the environment. This is our example. We have uh, different binding occurrences like a person data type is an identifier, X is an identifier, F is an identifier, A, Y, X here, main, and this A are all user-defined data types. Uh, sorry, user-defined identifiers. Now, uh, if I give you this two points, one and two, you can give me the corresponding M1. But that's okay here. And one, we have the environment contains the available user-defined identifiers. Can I use X? Yes, but not this X, because there is a local X. So X is a part of environment which gives you this local X. Uh, then I have Y, I have A, I have person. Person is a data type, but it is an identifier. So it is available, so I can define a person variable here at this line. Uh, F is an identifier, which is actually a function. So I can use that because I can I can use recursion in C. So F is a part of the one. Uh, main, no. And this A, yes, but not this A. And if you add all of them, you will find an environment. So it's like this one. Uh, on the other end, uh, we have some identifiers which are not accessible like this X because global X hides it. And this uh, A, which is on a different environment, this main, which is after the function definition. So the order of declarations are also significantly different. If you look into the second environment, you can come up with a different set because there are new local definitions and a scope, which is F, is over. So the locals of F will not be available and locals of main will be available. Uh, so here we have person, again, a data type. X is a struct person, which is global. Now, since we don't have a local X, now it is a global one. F is a function, A is double, which is local to main and main can call itself. It's a little bit strange uh, because main is the first function executed, but yes, it can call itself. If you try, you will see an infinite curse. Of course, there are ways of avoiding that passing parameters, but so this way we can define the environment. So environment is important because programming ha language has to figure out this. It is not your job, but the programming language's job to track the environment during compilation or execution to keep track of the environment so that when user has an applied occurrence of that identifier, it is going to match that. Uh, another design choice is the block structure. It tells you where you can define the environment, uh, define the uh, declarations uh, or new identifiers and their scope. Uh, we basically have different block structures. For example, C has uh, functions and command blocks. That means curly braces within any where in your code define a local scope. Uh, in Java, we have all class definitions, class member function declarations, block commands, and our local scope. And we have nested function definitions and class definitions and namespaces, so you will have 
as many levels of nest as possible in the uh, scope of identifiers. And Haskell, it is again nest scope language, that means we have as many let in blocks as you like, as each other, so you will have all different local scores. Uh, in early uh, days of computation, uh, we have uh, Fortran and COBOL are the earliest languages. Uh, in COBOL, uh, they have a monolithic block structure, saying that there's no other scope than the global scope. Uh, all def definitions, declarations are global. Uh, you cannot create local scopes that are only available within some boundary. Uh, it, what, what is the disadvantage of this? First of all, uh, you have to use new variable names for all new entities. So uh, you cannot uh, have local part declare a variable within that local part. It is created and it is over when you finish with it. So that that name will not clash with the other names. Uh, so you can go out of uh, variables, identifiers that uh, longer codes, like 10,000 lines of code. You can make it difficult to find uh, names. Of course, such a language has abstraction problems, which are more serious than the scope problems. But it will make your life a little bit hard anyway. Uh, another option is a flat block structure. So you define uh, functions as local scopes, other than it is uh, either global or function, and you only allow one level of nesting. That means you have either local or close. Uh, it's a flat block structure. It is uh, used by Fortran. And, uh, C has partially flat block structures uh, because it is uh, not allowing nested functions. In the nested block structure languages, we have uh, as many levels of nesting as possible. Functions within functions and scopes within scopes are possible. So they are completely arbitrarily, as long as you follow this rule of you have to close a T4, then uh, without interleaving uh, another local scope. Uh, Pascal and Java are less block structure, and since C allows the curly brace uh, scopes at any position of executing code, uh, it is also nested in some sense. Uh, GCC has uh, interesting uh, implementation of C standards. Uh, it has not standard version, non standard uh, feature, uh, which is uh, the nested functions can be applied. So, this code you see here, uh, S and G, is completely legal in GCC and only GCC. Uh, in other scope, actually, you are familiar with this from the other uh, programming languages courses, the introduction uh, courses. Uh, the local uh, declarations uh, coexist with the global declarations, or in a nested structure, the inner declarations of the same name coexist with the outer declarations. Uh, this phenomenon is called hiding. In hiding, uh, the innermost block is the uh, valid one and the others uh, are uh, hidden uh, by uh, the, uh, the local ones. So we have, uh, if you are trying to find out a binding occurrence and its correspondence, from the inner block you go to the outer, 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 outer scopes and first uh, time you find the binding occurrence, it is your very so this is how you uh, treat that so in this code for example we have a here x here global x here we have a local f here this function f here local y here and they are resolved by the rules of binding by local one hides the outermost one local one hides the global one 
local X size the outer X. Uh, for discussion of uh, defining, uh, the parameters are equal to local variables. So they hide in the same way they hide in the local variable. Uh, now uh, we have uh, our uh, next question. And the next question is, uh, when to do this uh, checking operation? So this comes with uh, type checking also. Uh, when we should uh, check, uh, make this binding operation, determine the environments and uh, do the binding of applied occurrences to the corresponding binding occurrences, making this mapping. Uh, first and clear option is the compilation. Uh, in the compilation, we have clues, which are our syntax, the function declaration, curly braces, locals, classes, methods, whatever you have in your language. And uh, we can use those clues to keep up our environment at compile time. And based on our environment at the compile time, we bind all of the applied occurrences to corresponding binding. Uh, the second option is a little bit odd one, is do everything at runtime. So build our environment during our execution of our program. So that each time you have a new function call, the function introduces its local environment, and it is our current environment. And then you nest functions one uh, into each other, during the runtime, we have building our M1, so all of the uh, bindings are done based on that. That means uh, calling a function f from your main will be different than calling f from g, because g will introduce its runtime environment and f will build on top of it. Main uh, f on top of main will be different than main g f. So uh, you can come up with different. Uh, bindings for the same function. On the other hand, in the static binding, since it is static at compile time, you don't know f is called from t or main. It will be always the same, because you look on only the picture of your program. So uh, what a compiler does in the static binding, it goes over all of the uh, declarations, and uh, F during compilation, it introduces its local scope. And F finishes, it removes that. G introduces its local scope, finishes, main, and so on. And it doesn't care or it cannot know who is calling whom. So it only looks the shape of your code. The lexical scope uh, is the term for that. Uh, and it will determine the binding based on that. Almost all languages. Uh, not all, but 95% uh, of the languages apply specific binding because it is uh, easier and you don't have to do that at runtime and so on. It has many such advantages. Uh, and most of the important advantages, it is easier for a human being to uh, trace the binding as well. Uh, so this is the binding of our code, basically. As you can see, the applying the hiding, we have locals overriding the globals. Globals are green here in this case, and reds are uh, locals. Uh, and uh, yellow is the parameter. So based on that, we have all this binding can be determined at compile time. Okay, why? is the parameter y, x is global tier. In this scope, you can fix the environment and it will tell you. Same codes can be uh, uh, interpreted differently in dynamic binding. In the dynamic binding, Okay, so uh, this uh, process can be different. So in this case, what we need to do is we need to trace our code. We need to look into execution of our code in order to understand the binding. This is how runtime binding works. So uh, in this trace, what we do is we will keep our 
and one enemy during the execution. So initially we will have global X and Y, and then we call main. Calling main means my environment is uh, added with new variables, which are local Y and A. So now our environment in main is access from global, Y is, and A is uh, from the local of main. Now this is our new environment. And in that case, when I call F, F will, be, F will build on top of that, meaning F will see Y as the F Y, the local Y, A as main A, and X is global X. So we have something interesting here. Now, F has access to main local variable, which is not possible in static mining. So here in this code, you can use A actually. And this is coming from this dynamic environment. Main is pushing its environment and F is building on top of it. Then we uh, return a value uh, after our computation. We return a value. And as soon as we return, we go back to the environment before X. And uh, we go back to main environment, which is here. We go back to that. And we call G. G introduces its own locals, X is 3. So X is not global X anymore. It is X of G. And when it calls F, this is the uh, change in the trace uh, happening. Now F will build on top of this environment, which says X is coming from G. It is not coming from global. In the static binding, this uh, X is always global X. X of F is always global X. But in this one, we are, uh, or our program sees global X here. And it is going to return F and G and so on. Uh, please uh, take a little time to understand this trace and repeat that trace. Uh, if we uh, can do it in the following days, we will have an interactive online session to trace other programs as well. Uh, so here, uh, in this uh, example, uh, in order to understand that, you can do uh, something else. You can do this trace in a different way uh, by uh, expanding it in place. So uh, this uh, code, the same code in the slide, can be expanded this way. So that means instead of having function calls in the usual way, now I'm, I'm having function calls as expanded in line so that main locals will be available to S and G locals like here uh, I believe I had a mistake here I forget this will be available to F so that this X F is using this one basically is coming from this one so this flat uh, case uh, you can uh, understand uh, the uh, working of uh, dynamic binding batch, I believe. Uh, so how did I do in the main? I write my code here. And when I call a function, instead of calling function in place, I expand the function body so that, and this is the parameter pass, A is come from upper. The F, A is passed as a parameter to G. And then I execute my code. I return it when I call G. I expand G code here. And then within that, F, F expanded here. And when you trace this code on the uh, right-hand side of your screen, you will see that it will turn out into uh, the runtime uh, binding. And it will have the same trace. Uh, so this is uh, dynamic binding uh, and uh, 
in uh, different scenarios, the situation gets much more complicated. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, I can define functions here. In this code, you will see a now I have also uh, a declaration of function here and another one here. So uh, if you uh, use static mining here, actually it is easy. Uh, this uh, function will be uh, coming from this uh, function declaration. Uh, and sorry about uh, the others. Other will be uh, this one. And in the fun uh, in the function where the other is used here. And this function will call this function, and the other will be this other. So the binding will work without any uh, trouble. So let me draw the uh, bindings for you. So here, uh, if you use static mining, this function is uh, coming from this function, and uh, this in the body of function, the other is lexically this other, and this function is bound to, bound to this one. And without any trouble, you can tell how this uh, will end up. This other is never used actually because it is never bound. However, if you go to uh, runtime binding, x is y function other, this function call will call this function and it's going to call others. Only other in current environment is this one. So in the first call, it will be bound to this one. But in this body, now we have a new other is introduced. And this other will be in the dynamic environment. So when I call this function, again, uh, the same function will be called. However, in this second call of the function, now I have another other. So this other in the second time will be bound to this other. OK. The first and second binding of function is the same. However, the other, first one will end up in a different value. The second one will be a different value because of other is bound to two different functions. Uh, so if, if we are lucky, we can have examples of this in the uh, interactive session. Uh, so uh, in order to do this binding process, our compiler does uh, have to keep a, a environment uh, during compilation in the dynamic case in the runtime, uh, which we are going to call a symbol table or an identifier table. Uh, so the, um, in this table, we will have all uh, current uh, So in symbol table uh, and or identifier table. Uh, in this table, we keep all of the currently active findings so that when we use an applied occurrences of an identifier from this table, we can find uh, which is which. Uh, so this uh, each declaration will insert into this table and each binding will use that table. And when the scope is over, they will be retracted. So it will go back in the uh, environment, so it is like local scopes push uh, entries in symbol tables, and when they are over, they uh, are taken back. Usually, it is implemented as a hash table in the uh, compiler, uh, and it's a compile time data structure, and it is related to uh, compilation. Uh, and when compilation over, we uh, erase this table, we, it's a compiler entity, and you, we don't need it at runtime. But in uh, dynamic binding languages, we need this in runtime as well. Uh, so now, uh, actually, we are over uh, the, 
details of binding. Now, uh, binding comes with uh, typical uh, syntactic entity, which we call declarations. In the declarations, we have um, different scopes, and within those scopes, you have declarations interacting differently. So these are uh, different types of declarations we have here. And let me just go over them. Uh, by the way, this is uh, something uh, controversial, uh, the difference between definition and declaration. First controversial, if it exists, so is there a difference between them? Um, usually we use them interchangeably without any uh, difference. But if you force me to make a, a difference, it's, it can be done this way. Uh, the definition will create a new name for existing binding. On the other hand, declaration will create a completely new thing. Uh, so if you remember our discussion between uh, the type checking, uh, structural type checking versus uh, name equals, so definition like a name equals. So you redefine the same thing. Use a different name to exist same thing. But the declaration is created, like a variable is created versus variable is given an alias. Uh, like C type def is like a definition where struct person is a declaration. Uh, in C++, for example, you can have a variable like that, double X, uh, it is a declaration. Uh, this one, which is a new reference to existing variable, it will not create a new storage, which is a definition. But be used interchangeably, uh, so usually this distinction is just uh, practically does not exist. So one uh, common uh, way of uh, composing declarations is sequential declarations. We have many declarations here. Uh, the sequencing means D1 is available after it is over. D2 is available after over, so it is uh, the declarations build up. Uh, the body of D1 cannot access body of D and minus one, for example, D3. So forward uh, references are not possible. This is because of some uh, economy of compilation. Compil compilers go over your code in different passes. And if you touch a, a sequential building of declaration, it is both easier to read for people, but also uh, it will uh, do a small number of passes over your compiler code to find out uh, the binding. Uh, so you sh you cannot go forward if you do not do something specific, and, and this is the default case for uh, C. If you remember, we have prototypes in C, so that we put uh, a prototype uh, so that uh, it will be part of the uh, declaration. So if I should show it just in our code here. So if you put the prototype of G here, now F can refer G, otherwise it's not possible. Uh, another way is the collateral declarations. This is a, a rare case. Uh, I only know ML of such an example. Declarations are only available at the end. That means D1 cannot refer to D2, D2 cannot refer to D1. So all those declarations cannot refer to each other. So this should be D, by the way. Uh, and all of them will be available after the declaration block is over. So this is just uh, for avoiding collisions uh, between the declarations. Sometimes it can be useful. Uh, the next one is the recursion, and the recursion declaration is available immediately in the body. That means you are declaring the name, and that name can be used in the body itself. This is quite uh, useful when you are uh, defining recursive data types, actually, uh, and also it is very useful when you are defining recursive functions. The function body is the declaration body, and it can refer to function itself in order to make a recursive call. And also, if you remember your linked list definitions, uh, tree definitions, uh, the declaration uh, body of a data type can refer to itself. Uh, in C, functions and type declarations are recursive, but not variables. 
uh, in ML, also very good expressions are recursive. That means uh, you can do uh, interesting things uh, like uh, but this one. So let me just. Start and uh, let x is one. So you can define x such a way so that it will have this many x's. So uh, x is referring to itself. So uh, in such a definition, sometimes you can do useful things like take ten of. Take hundred of x, so this is still uh, useful in the computation sometimes. So uh, another way is the recursive collateral declarations. Uh, it is uh, actually this this game is, uh, this name is not uh, standard name, but uh, it is about everything mutually exclusive. That means each declaration is available to the each other uh, in uh, the declaration body. It, is, uh, it says everyone can access everyone without the order being significant. Uh, in uh, Haskell, it is default, so everything is quite recursive in Haskell. Uh, in ML, user can do this by using and close and recurse close. Uh, in C++, class member functions are collaterally recursive. So each member function can refer to each other, uh, another member function without the order being significant again. In C, you have to define prototype of each of the function in order to get that. Uh, block expressions are the declaration blocks. So the expression body here in this case, this one, is computed in a set of uh, local declarations. So your local, local declarations purpose is to give you the expressions value, and which is a very common uh, case in Haskell with let clauses. So this declarations here are only available for this expression. Uh, also, to, since it is just a quarter, they can refer to each, uh, each other, but uh, our Syntactic entity is the expression, and all they are available for them. Uh, hiding also works in block expressions as expected. So why hide x and so this x is in my local x and y is in my this y and so on. Uh, in GCC again, uh, only GCC extension, which is not C90 or any other C standard, we can do that through block expressions. So we can have uh, a group of local declarations and like this one and their purpose is to compute a for example this minimum defines a temporary so if b is a we compare them so this is uh, the sorting expression so minimum will be a and b will be all the value of a thanks to that thanks to this local declaration yet. We can do that. Uh, block comments are quite common thing in uh, C. We have uh, this, a block comment and within that you can have declaration. But C only allows you to have variable declarations, not function declaration. In other languages, other uh, structure languages, you can also define functions here as well. Uh, the uh, block declarations are a different type. Uh, they say or they define in order to make a declaration, you make local declaration. So the declarations are available to uh, only a local one. So you have D1, D2, Dn are only declarations are only available to make another declaration here. So this is a function declaration. And whole purpose of those local declarations is to give that. 
other world cannot access them. Uh, this has better examples uh, in other languages. Uh, and they are used to give you encapsulation, etc. But we are going to revisit them uh, later in the encapsulation. And this is the uh, summary of all. Uh, we have defined the scope environment, the variables, hiding and compile time versus runtime, which is static versus dynamic binding, uh, how declarations can be composed. Uh, and how declarations can uh, define uh, local scopes for the syntax against these. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to continue with the next chapter in another video. Thank you.